So today we're going to talk about data management. And uh, here's uh, some motivational tweets. One of the biggest failures I see in junior machine learning engineers, complete lack of interest in building data sets. Uh, there's much, you know, so much to be learned in putting together a data set. It's like half the problem. Here's a poll that someone put together of data scientists uh, a couple of years ago. So like most people's, most of their time is spent on cleaning data and moving data as a data, data scientist. And then another kind of Twitter data science person, Matt Kelsey, said that for the last few projects that they've been involved in, most of the complexity was in the data flow and not actually the GPU training. And, you know, when we think about what data management for deep learning specifically actually entails, there might be a lot of different sources of data, right? You might have images on S3 maybe a bunch of text files just somewhere on the file system, log files, maybe even spread across machines, records in a database. But at some point, you gotta get all that stuff over to a local file system that's next to a GPU, right, or many GPUs. And that's specifically because we're doing deep, deep learning. That's you know, one of the constraints we have. Now, the way you're gonna get data <clears throat> over to that kind of trainable format is different for you know every single project, every single company. It's going to be a unique path. So for example, maybe you're training on ImageNet, right? And all the images are just S3 URLs. And all you have to do is just download them over to the local file system. Or maybe you have a bunch of text files that you crawled yourself from some from somewhere. And then you want to use, you know, Spark to process them on some cluster that you have, and then have a data frame that you can then look at and analyze for some, you know, for some task and then select the subset and then get that subset over to a GPU. Or maybe you're collecting logs and uh, records from your database into you know, Snowflake, a data lake or warehouse. And then from that, you'll process it and get it over into trainable format. So there's a lot of, you know, a lot of different possibilities that we're not going to completely cover in this lecture. And in fact, we're going to talk a lot about, you know, the minutia of, of data management. But before we get into that, I wanted to cover some key points. And the number one key point is we don't want to spend a lot of time with our data set, but we should spend, you know, 10, 10 times as much data, as much time as we want to on actually just becoming one with the data, you know, let the data flow through you. The second key point is that data is often the best way to improve your overall machine learning project performance. So instead of trying a new algorithm or instead of trying a new architecture or instead of kicking off a, kicking off a hyperparameter search, adding more data is, is usually the best way to improve performance. And in the absence of new data, at least coming up with ways to augment your existing data. That's often the best kind of bang for your buck. And lastly, we're going to talk a lot about complex pipelines and stuff like that and all these terms. And it's good to know them, but it's also good to keep it simple, you know, and not overcomplicate things. It's actually not that difficult. Like at the end of the day, we're just trying to get data into a form that we can load onto a GPU. It's not rocket science. It ends up taking a lot of our time, but we should try to keep it as simple as possible still. So from the infrastructure lecture a couple of weeks ago, we, we focused on the training and evaluation part of the landscape. And today we're going to focus on the data part. So that includes you know, sources, data lake, warehouses, processing, exploration, labeling, and versioning. We'll start with the sources. For most deep learning applications, we're going to need a lot of proprietary data. And there's some exceptions to this. For example, reinforcement learning, GANs maybe, and then projects where the barrier to entry is not necessarily a proprietary set of data, but a proprietary method of computing, right? So it's either you need you know thousands of GPUs and millions of dollars and maybe some know-how and how to how to run it, which is what I think the case with GPT-3 is. 
right? Like an open source effort to replicate GPT-3 hasn't yet finished and it's been going on for a few months and it'll probably take a few months longer. But for most other things, we'll need a proprietary data set. Now, publicly available data sets are useful, but there's no competitive advantage to them, right? Anyone can get the same public data set and, and get to the same level of performance that your model was able to get to. But it's useful to you, they're still useful to us because they serve as a, as a starting point for whatever we're doing. So usually, you know, a company or a project will end up spending money and, and, and labeling time on labeling their own data. So an example would be satellite imagery, right? If you're trying to do something for a financial application, real estate application, agricultural application, you're probably going to need different labels than, than other people. There's, I don't even know if there's a public data set. There probably is, but it's small. So most of the time you'll have to purchase the data and then purchase people's time and, and uh, effort in labeling it. Data flywheel is an interesting concept where if you can get your model out there in front of the users, but then develop your product in such a way that your users actually contribute good data back to you or clean your data even and, 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 and fix up your model predictions, then that usually is called a data flywheel and it can enable really rapid improvement after you get that V1 model out there. Semi-supervised learning is a very important idea that is in vogue right now. And, and the idea is that you don't necessarily need to spend money on labeling your data. You can just formulate the problem in such a way that the task is slightly different, right? It might be using a part of the data to predict a different part of the data. So for example, for text, you can predict future words from the past words. So like you complete the sentence basically, or you can predict the beginning of the sentence from the end of the sentence, or you can predict the middle word of a sentence from the word surrounding it, right? Or you can ask, do these two sentences occur in the same paragraph in any corpus in my training data? And so there's a bunch of ways to formulate the problem that you don't actually need to label anything. You just use the data to supervise itself and this can also apply to vision. And in fact, just a couple of days ago, Facebook AI research released this, this model called Seer, which was trained on a billion random images. So not ImageNet, but just random images from the internet. ImageNet, if you remember, is a million labeled images. This is a billion random unlabeled images. And yet, Training on this data set, they were able to achieve state-of-the-art accuracy on ImageNet, top one prediction task. And they released the library that they used for the, you know, formulating the task. And it includes loss functions like contrastive divergence loss. So it's worth taking a look at called uh, VISL. Augmenting your training data is something that is really just table stakes. You must, you, you must do it, at least for vision models. So on the right here, we have an example of, you know, one way you can, or some ways you can augment, augment data. So the top row are images that are original, and then the bottom rows are different augmentations of the images. So you can mess with the contrast, kind of crop different parts of it, invert it, like take patches out of the image, blank out patches of the image, pixelate it, rotate it, shear it. You know, we did a lot of this in the lab also last time. And every framework like TensorFlow, PyTorch, they provide functions that help you do this. And it's done at the same time that the, so you, you, on the CPU, you run tasks that are augmenting your data set, and then you feed the GPU with the augmented data, and you do these two things in parallel. So, so basically, as the GPU trains, the CPU is generating training data. For tabular data, you could simulate missing data by just kind of blanking out some of the cells. For text data, I don't think there are good techniques that are you know well established, but you could replace words with synonyms. You could change the order of some things. For speech and video, like temporal data, you could crop out portions of it. You could change the speed and kind of sh you know shrink and uh, grow the the timeline. You can inject different types of noise. You can mask out different frequencies. For video, you can do all the same stuff that we do for images. 
Synthetic data is an interesting idea that is often worth starting with, but not often actually used in my experience. So we linked to a blog post here from Dropbox who created an OCR, optical character recognition pipeline, using a lot of synthetically generated images of words. And then they use that for their kind of processing documents that people store in Dropbox. And the synthetic data can actually get pretty deep. So this is a project I found from Andrew Moffat on training OCR on receipt images. And the receipts are actually rendered in some 3D engine, like Unreal Engine or something. And so it's actually a full you know, 3D deformation of the surface because people's receipts are often crinkly. You can simulate lighting conditions like crazy shadows. So, you know, all the images on the right are, are, are synthetically generated. And yet you still have perfect ground truth data, right? Because you know exactly how the deformation was done. And so you know exactly what the label still is for every single pixel on the image. And for driving and robotics, this is, I think, more or less table stakes and uh, is often called sim to real. And it's actually something that Josh Tobin worked on, if you want to chat with him about it. So next up, let's talk about storage. We'll talk about the building blocks, file system, object storage, databases, data lakes slash data warehouses, what should go where, and then how we can learn more. So the file system is really the foundational layer of, of storing data. And the unit that we like to think of is a file, right? Which can be a text file or a binary file is not versioned. There's no version that's done through the file system can be easily overridden or deleted. And this can really be just you plugging in a hard drive and, you know, formatting and putting the files you need on it could be networked like the NFS uh, system. So the, the same hard drive can be accessed from different machines, can be distributed like the Hadoop file system, stored and you know accessed from multiple machines and actually stored over multiple machines also. And the file system in general, right, is the fastest option we have when it comes to, when it comes to storage. And in fact, it's really, really fast now so on the, here's two plots. There's three rows, the um, SATA hard drive, SATA SSD, solid state drive, and then the NF, NVMe SSD, which is the newest technology. And on the left, we see throughput. So that's like, if you were to copy a file, at what speed would it actually be copied? And the hard drive is the slowest, right? That's the actual spinning platter, like magnetic hard drives with a read head and stuff like that. So there's, they're limited by the rate at which the magnetic disc can spin. And it's pretty slow, right? It's like 200 meg gigabytes per second or something like that, or it's megabytes per second. And then the SSD drives are faster, much, much better technology, but it's pushing maybe 500 mega megabytes per second. And then the latest iteration of hard drive technology, the NVMe, is much, much faster, right? So it's pushing three gigabytes per second. And same with seek time. So that's how long would it take you to find, to, to, to go to a file on disk that you're not currently at. And this makes sense when you think of like a head reading a magnetic disk, right? It actually has to seek to the location on disk that contains the start of that file. And it's very slow, right? It's like two milliseconds to seek to uh, some place on the disk much slow, much faster on SSDs and much, much faster on the NVMe SSDs. What format should we store data in? So for binary data, like images, audio, videos, um, stuff like that, just files is usually what you would do. So image files in a folder and many folders. In TensorFlow, you have this TF record format which exist to, in order to batch binary files. So instead of, let's say a million individual image files, you would have a thousand or maybe a hundred batch files. And then each batch file contains, you know, nicely formatted individual files. That makes sense if you're seeking with, you know, the 
the old school hard drives. It doesn't seem that necessary with, with the latest really fast NVMe drives. For large, as in like big data, you know, tabular data or text data, there's some choices. So you could have them as also just files and that's perfectly fine, just a bunch of text files. But if you have loaded files from different sources and you've loaded them into a data frame and you wanna store that so that next time you start in the project, you can kind of start from, not from scratch, but from some interim format, you have some choices. You have HDF5, which is powerful, but it's very bloated in terms of its feature set. It's like hard, it basically like re-implements a file system in a lot of ways, and it doesn't seem to be in active development anymore. Meanwhile, uh, Parquet is a widespread format. It comes from the Hadoop and kind of Spark, uh, you know, big data world. And it's what I would recommend right now for storing this kind of data. And then Feather is the most recent good option. It's powered by an open source project called Apache Arrow. And it's, so it's kind of up and coming. It's getting better, you know, every year, very active development. And Apache Arrow aims to be basically like the interchange format for data analytics. So it's a columnar data store that's memory mapped for really fast operations on it, even for data that doesn't quite fit in memory. And then TensorFlow, PyTorch, they all provide their own data set interfaces like data loader for PyTorch and um, tf.data for TensorFlow. So you, you know, try to use them as much as you can because that's kind of like the officially sanctioned way to load data. And I think the further you stray from that, the likelier it is that you'll encounter some cases where it's like all of a sudden really slow. Next up from the file system is we have object storage. And so you can think of this as an API over the file system. So, so Amazon S3 is the canonical example, right? We can get files, we can put files, we can delete files, and we can think of these operations as basically REST API calls. And we don't actually worry about what physical disk the files are on. We just know that, you know, the file's on S3. I'll be able to get it. I'll be able to store it. And the object can be a, a text file, it can be a binary file, and oftentimes it is a binary file. And the interesting thing about this is that you can build in versioning and redundancy into the API, right? So as you store a file, the backend can just increment some version number. So instead of overwriting your old file, it can just store a V2 of, of that file. And it's definitely not as fast as just reading files from local, from some local drive, but it's fast enough uh, especially within the cloud, right? So if you're on a cloud compute instance and you're accessing files on S3, that tends to be pretty fast. And in fact, this is a slide from, I believe, Databricks recommending that people store, you know, log files or whatever files they're analyzing in, in, in the Databricks environment on S3 versus configuring their own HDFS file system to do it. And the reasons they give are S3's elastic, right? You can store like any number of files on it. It's pretty cheap. It's very highly available. It's like incredibly durable, right? It doesn't lose data. It can even have transactional rights. And so it it's quite nice. The database is a word that we use to refer to persistent, fast, and uh, scalable storage and retrieval of structured data that will be accessed repeatedly. So what that means is, so for example, logs are structured data because it's like timestamp, you know, page uh, that was visited, the rest verb like get or put or whatever. It's, so it's structured data, but it's not expected to be accessed repeatedly. It's, it's a log, right? You store it just in case you need it, but most of the time you don't need it, whereas, in the database, you wouldn't store logs. You would store things like the username of, of your user or the label of this image, right? Stuff that you expect that might change and you might need to look at repeatedly. 
So OLTP is a term you might have heard, online transaction processing. So this refers to the kind of database we're talking about. The mental model to have is that the reason it's really fast is because everything is actually just held in memory. So there's a running machine with all the data in its memory and it persists everything to disk and it has guarantees that it will persist to disk and it won't get lost and there's consistency guarantees like it won't let two conflicting writes through and so on. But the reason it's really fast is because it's actually not on like it's not seeking from disk most of the time. It's just in RAM. And this is not for binary data, right? You should store references to binary data in the database. So you store the URL of something in S3 and then you store the actual binary image in S3. Postgres is the database that we recommend most of the time. The reason for that is it's a great SQL database and it also supports unstructured JSON. And SQLite is perfectly good for small projects. And it's in fact used by a lot of things you might've used like mobile apps and stuff like that, have a SQLite backend running. You might've heard NoSQL. That was kind of a big thing in 2010s stuff like Mongo and there's a bunch of them. Um, and this mostly refers to storing unstructured JSON, right? So instead of having a schema for your data, a schema being something like ID is going to be an integer field, name is going to be a string field, you know, created at is going to be a, a date stamp and so on. The NoSQL approach is to not have a schema, but just whatever you want to store, well, just make a JSON document with that data and then just store it into the NoSQL database, and then we'll be able to fetch it. And it obviously isn't going to be as fast at fetching data or analyzing data as an actual relational database. And it's obviously also might have some consistency issues where like two separate writes might go through that actually conflict with their interpretation of the state of the world. So let's mostly avoid them, except Redis is really very useful when you just need a simple key value store. So for a lot of projects, you don't need a database. You just need like a persistent dictionary. And so Redis is great. There's the notion of a data warehouse, which is some kind of aggregation of different data sources structured in a single place for analysis, also known as OLAP, online analytical processing, instead of OLTP, online transaction processing, right? And uh, another acronym you might've heard is ETL. So that stands for extract, transform, load. And so the idea is you have all these different data sources, like maybe logs in the cloud, your transactional processing database, which is maybe Postgres. Then maybe you just have a bunch of like flat text files or something. And you're going to extract data from all of them, transform it into some common schema, and then load it up into the data warehouse. And then from the warehouse, you can then have load the subset of data you need and generate reports, run kind of analytical queries. The software for this stuff like BigQuery from Google, uh, Redshift from Amazon, Snowflake. And most of these solutions use SQL as the interface to the data. So SQL obviously is a very old language and and, and uh, some solutions like, for example, Databricks use data frames instead of SQL. So SQL is the standard interface for structured data. But in Python, Pandas is the main data frame solution and is usually what people reach for when they need to kind of analyze data using Python. <laughs> So here on the right is a comparison between SQL and data frame. So let's say you want to select, you know, three columns from some data table called tips. Uh, so you want to select total bill, tip, smoker, and time from tips. And then the first five results. So you say select total bill, tip, smoker, time from tips, limit five. That's what SQL looks like. But with a data frame language like pandas, you have tips as an object and you select columns, total bill, tip, smoker time. And then you say, you know, head five, give me the first five results. And of course this gets more interesting when you start joining different data sources. So grouping by different columns, 
counting, aggregating things. And so SQL, like, you know, I prefer the data frame language in the first example where you were just selecting columns, but I prefer SQL actually in the second example where you now have to do some analytical grouping and stuff like that. So if you've never used SQL and if you've never used Pandas, our advice is to try to use both, you know, try to find a project that gives you a chance to use SQL, try to find a project that gives you a chance to use Pandas because to be a good data engineer, data scientist, or machine learning engineer, or even machine learning scientist, I think at some places, you should really be fluent in SQL. Data Lake is the idea that kind of came out of the data warehouse. And the idea is that, well, we have all these sources like databases, logs, and stuff like that. And, and the data warehouse approach is we have to settle on a schema, transform all these data sources into that schema and then store them. But what if instead we did extract load and then transform? So we'll extract data from all these sources, load it into the data lake, and then later we'll transform it into the format we need for analysis. So let's just dump everything in um, kind of into this lake. And then later we'll be able to settle on a transform of the raw data in the lake and maybe load it into a data warehouse or maybe just load into something that can do analysis on it. And the trend in the field is to kind of do both in the same suite. So the Databricks lake house platform is both a warehouse and a data lake. And it's an open source project called Delta Lake, which is quite nice, where you can store all data, structured data, semi-structured data, like maybe logs, and then unstructured data, like just like a bunch of text files that you crawled from the internet or, or even images, right? Or even videos, you store all of it in Delta Lake. And then later it is able to connect to your analytics engines and potentially even to machine learning engines. So that's kind of the Databricks vision and the vision of the field as, as a whole. So that was a lot, but for now, just think about it this way. If you have to store data, if it's binary data, like an image, then store it as an object, right? To store it in S3. If it's metadata about that data, right? If it's data about that binary data, like a label for an image, or some user activity, like who uploaded this file and stuff like that, that goes into the transactional database. If you need features from something which is not already in the database, so for example, logs, like how many times did a user log in and like look at this image, then set up a data lake and dump everything into it and then set up a process to aggregate all the data. And then when you're ready to actually train using deep learning on that data, then copy everything you need onto the local file system, you know, next to the GPU on a drive that's as fast as you can manage. And that's, that's the guidance right now. There's a lot to this story. This is kind of like a part of the field that, well, I think all of the field is really in flux right now. And there's no, no different on the data side as it is on the training and evaluation side. So there's a lot going on. The reading for this week is this article from, from this VC about the emerging architecture for data infrastructure. And if you're truly interested in this stuff, then you know, take some more courses like databases. And you can also look at this book called Designing Data Intensive Applications. So this is a really good book and a common resource for this kind of stuff. So we've been alluding to like some you know, motivation. So let's just actually make it concrete. So let's say we have to train a photo popularity predictor every night because we're operating some website that that would be useful for. So for each photo, training data should have like, when was it posted? That, what title was it given? Where was it posted from? Then maybe, oops. Then maybe something about the user that maybe is like, how many times did they log in today? Right. And then we actually have some machine learning models that can identify what's in the image to some extent. So like what's the content of the image and then maybe what's the style of the image? Like, is it happy or sad and stuff like that? 
So the metadata is going to be in our database. Some of the features about the user, we probably actually need to compute from logs because they're not in our database. And then to see what's in the image, we need to actually run some classifiers, classifier models. So there's a number of tasks that all have to finish before we can train our model that will actually predict the popularity. And you know, some tasks can be started until other tasks are finished. So like we can't start training the popularity predictor until we've finished running all the content style models and also until we finished running our log analysis stuff and so on. And um, when a task finishes, it should like kick off things that depend on it, right? Because we don't want to have to keep managing this process. We just want to launch it once and have it complete automatically. And like recomputing something should depend on the content of it, not on some other stuff like the date, ideally. The dependencies we're talking about might not be, you know, simple files, but could be the outputs of programs or like something in the database. The work that we're doing is probably not only on one machine, but is over many different machines. And then we're not the only ones, you know, training our predictor. Maybe other people are training different things at the same time as we're training ours. So multiple things are happening all at once. And the old kind of big data, you know, flavor solutions to this are Hadoop and, and Spark. And so these are kind of like MapReduce implementations where you have to process in a bunch of data. So you launch a, a bunch of different tasks that each take a bit of the data and then that's mapping and then reduce it. You reduce their outputs into a single output and that's the reduce. And it should run on, on commodity hardware or like dis diverse hardware. And there's like things you can do about caching to, that really speed it up. And that's kind of like what puts Spark on the map. That's a little bit outdated because it assumes this like monumental or I guess monolithic, you know, processing environment. And in the modern environment, like you can, for example, run a machine learning model as part of running a Spark job, right? Unless that model itself is coded in Spark or however that's done. But if you just have some like, you know, a PyTorch model and then a TensorFlow model for something else, and then you need to analyze logs for something else, it's all very different. So the more modern things uh, probably began with this package called Airflow from uh, Airbnb. And it lets you define a DAG, a direct, direct a cyclical graph of jobs where the jobs can be maybe SQL operator operations, or maybe actually just Python program executions, right? Or maybe just simple files, but it lets you define a DAG out of like disparate things and then run it. And in order to run it, you need uh, a manager the workflow manager, this is often called, this is often called workflow processing. So the workflow manager has a queue of all the tasks that have to be done. They know about the dependencies between the tasks. They know the workers that are able to do the tasks and then they manage tasks. They assign tasks onto workers. If things fail, they'll restart them or alert you and so on. Apache beam is like one of these things and TensorFlow datasets, which, so TensorFlow, the TensorFlow team makes a lot of different datasets available through this Tensor, TensorFlow datasets interface. And they seem to use Apache Beam for this kind of processing. Um, and it runs on Google Cloud Dataflow, which is, you know, a cloud orchestrator. So for example, the T5 model, the transformer model that we discussed a few weeks ago, that was trained on something called the Colossal Clean Corpus, which is like a web crawl corpus that's seven terabytes in size. And before you can actually train on it, you need to process the raw, you know, crawl output into some trainable form. I'm not totally sure why they didn't do that for us, but they gave us the raw form and then, you know, gave us like scripts to be able to process it. 
And I think it requires, you know, hundreds of workers and still like 20 hours or so to, to, to process. Prefect is something that people use instead of Airflow increasingly. Same idea though, it's a Python framework that makes it easier to like define tasks. The tasks can be code or like SQL and stuff like that. And then the prefect hosted solution will then orchestrate it for you. So you don't need to worry about like launching your own orchestrator. You just define the tasks, push them over to prefect and then prefect tells your own hardware, right? What to actually run on or what to, what tasks to actually execute. DBT is uh, the ability to do stuff like this with SQL, right? So instead of writing Python code for a lot of this processing, could it, could it be done if you just wrote SQL? So this is for people who are comfortable with SQL, which a lot of data scientists often are, or data engineers. This is kind of a nice uh, solution. So they call it analytics engineering, which is quite a nice idea. Dagster is another data orchestrator that seems to be quite popular nowadays. Works with a lot of tools, test locally, you know, run anywhere. Okay, and then lastly, we're gonna jump over into the deployment side and talk about this idea called the feature store. And so the idea of the feature store was first popularized, to my knowledge, by Uber when they publicized their, their uh, machine learning platform called Michelangelo. And they, they posted this visualization of you know, some of what it has to do. And so it's divided into two, two halves. On top, we have the online processing and on the bottom, we have offline processing. And so the idea there is that to train your model, right, is an offline task. So we're gonna take data from our data lake. So this is Uber, so let's say we're trying to predict, we're trying to train a model that will predict how to price a ride, you know, given a bunch of historical data about demand and ride lengths and the availability of drivers and so on. So all that stuff is in our data lake. And that comes from a number of databases and log files and, and God knows what, but it ended up in the data lake, right? So. We're gonna prep the data using maybe Spark or SQL and load it up into the feature store, which is based on Hive. And then that feature store can be used to give uh, training data to our training algorithm, right? And from that, we'll put a model in the model repo. And then lastly, when the, when the model's ready, now we can actually deploy it in the prediction service. But in the prediction service, the data that's coming in for the model to predict on is not coming from the same flow, right? It's not coming from a data lake. It's not going through Spark. It's not landing in Hive. It's actually going through a separate flow, which in this case is the Kafka streaming, streaming engine and goes into the Cassandra, which is a different type of database feature store. And then from that to the train model. And the reason this is highlighted is because this can lead to a lot of bugs, right? Because these are two different data processing pipelines. One is offline, one is online. But if we can unify as much of their logic as possible into this unified kind of feature store, then that, that would be much better, right? Like we, we don't have two separate code bases. We don't have two separate sources of bugs and so on. So a bunch of people from Uber, I believe, started this company called Tekton, which is the main feature store company. And they give you another little visualization, right? So you have real-time data and batch data all going through the same transform store and serve process from the feature store. For an open source alternative, take a look at Feast, which you know, implements the same type of ideas. Okay, lastly, as we talk about all this stuff and I just mentioned Hive and Cassandra and all that stuff, I think the tendency is like, it's overwhelming, like there's too much stuff. And I think that's true. And some of it is over-engineered. So let's try to keep things simple and, and try not to over-engineer until you really know why you need to. And as like a motivational example, like not a serious, you know, do this example, but as a motivational example, let's just take a look at the, the tools that like every Unix installation comes with, okay? 
So there's a blog post that was pretty famous at the time called Command Line Tools Can Be 235 Times Faster Than Your Hadoop Cluster. Hadoop was like the spark of its day in 2014. So the task was to analyze a bunch of, I think, log files for the presence of some word. And then, yeah, just count up the number of times this word appeared in like ter- in like gigabytes or, or maybe even terabytes of data. And it took 26 minutes on a Hadoop installation. And with simple Unix tools like cat and grep and sort and like unique, it took 70 seconds. So you just like, in this case, you catted all the files pipe them over to the grep command, pipe the results of that over to sort, pipe that to unique. Now what's interesting about, about that that you might not realize is that all these pipes are actually happening in parallel. So it's not the case that all of the cat command has to finish and then all the results are aggregated somewhere and then all of the results are sent over to grep. It's not the case, right? As cat streams its results, they get straight into grep and grep starts executing at the same time as cat is executing. And then as grep results come out, they get into sort and that starts executing. So these are actually happening like the OS manages, you know, parallelism here for us. And we can actually make it even faster by running it even more in parallel and and kind of instead of using grep using awk, which is, I guess, even more efficient for this particular thing. But xargs is another built-in Unix command that just has built-in parallelism. So if you need to do something a thousand times and it's actually distributed over like a thousand CPU cores, you can just say dash P 1000 and just launch a thousand of this process with like no extra complexity. So it's always worth looking at the tools you already have and just seeing, you know, how you can make them work for the task instead of it's like, oh, I heard about Cassandra, you know, for this thing, I must, that, mu- that must mean I have to use it, right? So let me go download and figure it out. But usually that's not the right strategy. We should try to keep things simple. So to move on, let's talk about exploration. So I hope you guys have all seen Pandas, right? It's really the workhorse of Python data science. If you have not used it, then definitely recommend doing a few projects using Pandas because it really is the data science, you know, tool of choice. And R has its own data frame, you know, Spark and, and uh, Scala, you know, they have their own data frame. But the basic idea is that it's like an object-oriented data analysis interface. So um, I, I don't talk much about that because I assume that most people know it. So I just wanted to share a couple of things that you may not know about. So Dask, for example, is a project that could speed up your pandas processing pretty dramatically if you're trying to process uh, data that's too large to fit in your memory, right? Dask is often a drop-in replacement, so they have their own data frame implementation that matches pandas interface, but paralyzes it, you know, paralyzes all the operations such that you can actually load very large amounts of data and analyze them. Similarly, a project called Rapids has the same approach, except scaling out data analysis specifically onto GPUs, right? So Pandas is not GPU accelerated, but the, this Rapids project aims to be basically a Pandas replacement that can do data analytics on GPU, which would be much, much faster. So it's worth taking a look at. I haven't personally used it. So next time, next up, let's talk about data labeling. We'll talk about user interfaces for it, sources of labor, and kind of service companies. So there's a standard set of features for data labeling. You know, you have bounding boxes, segmentations, key points, you know, cuboids for like 3D annotation. There's you know, some some classes that you can assign to the annotations. What's crucial is agreeing on what makes a good annotation. So, you know, training the annotators is a large part of, of, of doing an annotation project. So for example, here's a motivational example, I believe from CS231N, where, you know, reasonable people can, can disagree about exactly how to label the fox in the first row. Like, do we draw a little bit of space around the fox or do we focus on 
the face of the fox, and certainly in the second row, where like your human mind naturally just imagines the rest of the fox behind the rock, and you might annotate it that way. And that might be the right way to annotate it, or not, depending on what kind of project you're actually doing. And so it's worth really annotating a lot of your own data yourself first and writing up detailed guidelines with edge cases like this, such that your annotations come out reliable. Quality assurance of the annot annotations is also key. People just aren't you know, as conscientious across the board, like some will have better annotation quality than others. And where do you find people to actually annotate? So the choices are you could you know, hire your own annotators and maybe promote like the, the most conscientious ones to quality control the other people. So this is very secure, right? Because you can have them sign whatever you need. Once you hire them, they can work, you know, 40 hours a week. So it's pretty fast. And because they keep working on the same task, you know, less quality control is needed. But it's expensive. It's hard to scale. There's this overhead to, to the administration. You could crowdsource labor. So this is a Mechanical Turk, Amazon Mechanical Turk, where like people just all over the world go on online and do little tasks for cheap. And it is a lot cheaper and it's more scalable because you can find like a thousand people to do your task. But you know, it's not secure really. And then the quality isn't very high, partially because it's so cheap. Or you can hire a data labeling company. So it makes a lot of sense to hire a data labeling company for a large annotation project because it really is like a separate software stack to what we're using for training, right? It requires temporary labor. It requires quality assurance. So how do you find one to hire? Still have to you know, label a bunch of data yourself as like the gold standard and just so that you understand and are able to write good guidelines. Then you know, try different contenders, try to get a work sample on your gold standard sample and compare it to how, compare how they did to how you did. And then try to see, you know, what's the price to quality ratio. Figure eight is like the, probably the largest data labeling company founded by the same people who founded weights and biases. Funny enough. Scale.ai is the really dominant, you know, new company that does data labeling and they're sponsoring some prizes right for the class and there's a lot of others there's a crowded space there's label box supervisedly there's a bunch more right and full service data labeling you know is always pretty pricey and so maybe it's not exactly what you want but you still want to use purpose-built software for annotation so there's, there's choices in the market for just the software without the labor that comes with it. And there's actually a free option that's really good called Label Studio, which is a open source. You can run it yourself. There is an enterprise edition for hosting. And it's actually what we're going to do in lab um, is use Label Studio. So you can define your own labeling interface using this config format, which looks a lot like HTML code. Uh, and then you get the interface and you can start labeling and it's very flexible. Like you can mix different types of things. You can also implement different modules. Like you can, there's a backend module that serves up data. There's a front end module, which we, we, you can define the interface, but there's also a machine learning module that for example, can, you know, you can do active learning. So you might have a model running and maybe pre-annotating some of the examples so that what the human annotator sees is not just a blank image, but actually is already kind of annotated by a machine learning model. And then they just correct it if, if need be. And there's an interface for looking at your data, which is actually a huge part of the task here is just getting to grips with like all your, all of your data. Prodigy is a good solution for text data. And Aquarium is a recent company that was founded by a Berkeley alum. And it's, they, they build it as a machine learning data management platform. So the idea is that really exploring your data set is a big part of the task. And so it's a good tool for that. And, and they call it kind of curating data. And then when you find things that are difficult or mislabeled, then you can fix that and then kind of plug the data management tool into your machine learning workflow cycle.
Another really interesting vein of work here is in what's called weak supervision. And Snorkel, the Snorkel project is the, is the dominant tool here. It started out as an open source project and you know, there's still a version that's open source, but recently it also became a commercial platform, snorkel.ai. The idea is that we can label a bunch of data somewhat automatically with heuristic functions. So for example, let's say, you know, you have a bunch of reviews or something of restaurants, right? And you want to train a classifier of sentiment and there's certain words that you can just kind of, you know, regex for. And if you find them, it's probably a good review, like amazing and like awesome, you know, food is awesome, stuff like that. So you can think of all these heuristics and write a Python function that just says like, if, you know, there's text, food is awesome, then it's a positive review. And then via Snorkel, you can run that, which will label a lot of your data automatically but give you like really powerful tools to uh, correct that. And then it kind of tries to learn a model side by side with your heuristics. And the end result is that you're able to go through a lot of data and, and focus on edge cases very quickly instead of just going through in random order. The conclusions that we have are, you know, if you can afford it, just try not to spend time on labeling and just outsource if you can to a full service company. If you can't afford that, then at least try to use some existing software. And if you're hiring, then don't try to make crowdsourcing work. Just try to hire some part-time people on Upwork or something. So lastly, let's talk about data versioning. And there's four levels, which I will go through. So the, the zeroth level, right, is that your data just lives on the file system or in S3 and in like a database. And so you train on it, you have a model, you deploy the model, what's the problem? Right, well the problem is that your deployment really has to be versioned because you have to be able to like revert it, for example, and your code is versioned because that's good practice. Like as software engineers, we just know that we have to version code, but your machine learning model is partly code, but it's partly data. And so if your code is versioned, but your data is not versioned, then the deployed model is actually not versioned also. And you won't be able to get back to some previous level of performance because you just keep overwriting your model and you don't know what it's actually trained on. So the first level you might think is, well, okay, fine. Let's just snapshot everything. You know, all the data that we're training on, just snapshot it, archive it. And that's the version. And it actually, would work. It can get you back to past performance if you need to. It feels very hacky, right? Because, you know, it's, that's what people used to do to code actually before version control was widespread, right? It's a, every release, you would just zip up all of your code, you know, store it somewhere and just in case there's a bug in the new release, you'd be able to go back and try to figure it out. And so it would be a lot better if we could version data just as easily as we can version code. So that would be level two, right? Let's version data as a mix of assets and code. So let's store files that are large in S3. In S3, they get a unique ID. And then as part of your code repository, you could store, let's say a JSON file that points to these IDs and then maybe has some metadata like the label of, of the image. So you don't have to store the image in the repo, you just store the metadata about it. This metadata can still get quite large, but we could actually just store it in our Git repository using Git LFS, which stands for large file storage, natively supported by GitHub, and I believe you know, GitLab, the major Git hosts. So if you just you know, install Git LFS and you just track, let's say JSON files in Git LFS, then automatically as you commit, the, the, the JSON files will get uploaded to S3 behind the scenes. They'll be automatically versioned and you don't have to think or do anything different uh, other than what you're doing already. And this can, this, this totally works because the Git signature of that data file is the version of the data set, right? It, it, it fully defines the version of the data set. So 
Let's try to go above that then. Maybe our JSON file is just a terabyte big now, so we can't actually store it anymore. So there are specialized solutions for versioning data. I think we should avoid them until, until we can fully explain how on this specific project they would improve things over Git LFS. And those solutions are uh, DVC, Pachyderm, and Quill. Here's a helpful little diagram of some of these. Delta Lake is actually worth looking at also for this. But DVC is worth looking at in a little more detail. So it's open source version control system for machine learning project. So the idea is if you have a data file, you DVC add it, just like you git add a code file, you DVC add a data file. And then when you process the data, you say DVC run, and then the script that would process the data, and then the output name of the processed file. And so what that lets you do is that the DVC remembers the provenance of every data file or, you know, processed or interim data file or even model that came out of training automatically for you, right? So it knows like what, what raw data files was this particular model trained on? And it's able to recreate things intelligently. It seems like a good solution. So, so definitely check it out if, if you have that need. If you have the need for versioning databases, then there's a project called Dolt, which is quite interesting. <clears throat> and so it's basically a Git for, for SQL. So it makes, it makes it, so one thing that Git makes easy is merging, right? So like two different people can be working on the same file in parallel. And then if they, if there's some kind of conflict, they'll both try to commit. And then when one of them, you know, one of them will have to resolve it. And then Git makes resolving a conflict really easy. And so similarly, Dolt makes resolving database conflicts really easy, but it also has like a full SQL implementation. So that lets you kind of explore your data. So last thing I want to talk about is concerns about privacy. So like everything we've talked about so far kind of assume that we have access to, you know, unfettered access to the data and we can train on all of it. But a trend is that people and companies don't necessarily want to share data as freely as they used to. And this is particularly important in, in some settings, even today, like healthcare. And I think will be more important in a lot more settings in the future. But in healthcare, for example, you have very sensitive, you know, patient data that hospitals don't want to spend to some third party for training the model on. So federated learning is this idea that you can train a global model using data that's on local devices and, and the global model never actually has access to all of the data. So there's some amount of training that happens on the local device and then things are synced to the federated server. There's problems with this that have to be solved. And that's why it's an area of research right now. Like, you know, it's expensive to send all these things back and forth. The different systems that the model has to be trained on now are very heterogeneous. And there's still some privacy concerns. Like, are you actually able to de-anonymize certain things just from the model weights, right? So like, yeah, you never saw the data, but can you still get something about the data from just the model weights that are sent to the federated server? Similarly, a research area called, sometimes called differential privacy, deals with, at a theoretical level, with like the notion that like, could data be aggregated in such ways that you can't identify individual sources of the data? And another topic that's interesting is maybe learning on encrypted data. So could the data be encrypted at the source and then sent for training? And, and you can actually train, but you can't decrypt it. These three things are, are, I would say, research areas right now. I'm not aware of like really good tools that make it possible to do these things, but it's just something to, you know, keep in mind and maybe, may, and maybe you're interested in, for example, doing a project in this area. And if you know, if you know really good resources about it, then just let us know in Slack about them. So that's it on data management for today. So thank you.